So um, I assume uh, many of you attended the breakout, uh, the keynote session that Andrea and I just did, and we did a really brief run through of Docker 112 and the Docker orchestration features that we're announcing today. Um, the purpose of this session is really to do a deeper dive into that. And so the way we've kind of structured it is I'm the product manager, he's, he's the architect, so what I'm gonna do is first present Docker 112 orchestration from a user perspective. Like what are the commands, what do they do? Then we're gonna bring Andrea on and he's gonna talk about the architecture of the system, which is actually pretty cool. It's probably cooler than the stuff I'm gonna talk about. But, <laughs> um, but uh, and then we've tried to engineer this so that there'll be a good block, at least a 10 minute block at the end for questions because we wanna make this interactive. So I'd ask that you hold your questions during our presentations and then we'll have a good, we'll have a good question block at the end. Okay, so yeah, what's new in Docker? Spoiler alert, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, you, saw, you saw some of what that is in the last, last session. Oops. Uh, let me start out with swarm mode because this is, this is the orchestration stuff that we've built. Um, to create a swarm, you, you, you start by running the command docker swarm init. You run this on any of your engines. So, uh, in, the, in the keynote demo that we did, we had three VMs. And on the first VM, and it's just arbitrary, you know, which is which. On the first VM, we ran Docker Swarm init, and we got the first engine into our swarm. Okay, a one node swarm, not, not that useful. So the next command is Docker Swarm join with the IP address of the first machine. Obviously, you have to tell them how to find each other. And now you've got a swarm of two machines. And you can continue repeating this process, and you'll get a swarm of however many machines you want. So this is the basic construction of a swarm, two commands. As I mentioned in the keynote, there's a lot of cool security stuff that goes on behind the scenes. Andrea is going to talk about that in his section. But from a user perspective, this is what you do. Now let's talk about services. This is this new concept that we're introducing in Docker 112. It's, it's, the idea is that you can declare a desired state of your application and the engines, the swarm of engines, will enforce that desired state. So the example command I've given says to create a service called front end on a network, and these are overlay, traditional Docker overlay networks, the same overlay networks you're using now, uh, on a network called MyNet, let's suppose that we had set up such a network. That's just Docker network create MyNet. It's nothing fancy there. Uh, replicas three means we want three uh, containers in this service, and we're going to use that later for load balancing. But it, to start, we want three. We want three of these uh, front end containers. We're asking to publish the port 80 onto the host port 80, or the cluster port 80. So in other words, every one of these machines is going to expose port 80 for this service. And that's going to be an aspect of the routing mesh that I'm going to talk about and Andrea is going to go into even more detail about. So with this, and, and lastly, we're giving it an image the same way we do with Docker Run. That's that last that, uh, argument, uh, front end image latest. So doing this creates three containers. That, those are those radiator images, uh, graphics, and they're all connected on overlay network, MyNet. Now, you can add a second service. In this case, I wanted to add a Redis service. And it's exactly the same process. Docker, serv Docker Swarm create, you, you declare the name, you declare what network it's on, you give the image, Redis, Redis latest. And now all of these can communicate with each other on the overlay network, meaning that they're assigned IP, private IPs that allow them to talk to each other, because you typically want your front end service to be able to reach your Redis service. And in fact, we have uh, DNS-based service discovery, so the application code in your front end service can just say, connect to, quote, Redis, like that, like that host name, and it will find the Redis on this overlay network. Now I want to talk about node failure because this is one of the parts of the system that we're most proud of. This is this idea that there's no single point of failure and that the system will recover from machine failure without any operator intervention. So 
Let's suppose that this node dies. Now, it's running two containers. When this node goes away, those two containers obviously are going to go away. At this point, you have a deviation between the desired and the actual state, right? The desired state that we declared was three replicas, but there's only one replica of the black radiator icon running now because we've, we lost the other two. So we're going to, the, the machinery of Docker 112 orchestration is going to kick in and it's going to start up two new containers in order to bring the actual state back in line with what has been the desired state the entire time. That's three containers. Uh, now let's talk about scaling. So Andrea showed this in the keynote demo. We have a simple command, docker service scale, name of service equals number that you want. So here I'm scaling front end from three to six. You'll see three more containers came up. Again, they're on the same overlay network. Everything else is configured the same way. Uh, I can scale further to 10. It'll, it'll schedule more. You, you get the idea. Uh, now I want to talk about a feature called global services. We didn't really cover this in the keynote demo, but this is really, this is important for a lot of use cases. Um, sometimes you want a container that runs on every machine in your cluster. And when you add a new machine, you want that container automatically added. Uh, an example might be something like C Advisor, like a kind of utility or system container that's maybe not part of your application, but it's needed for logging or metrics, and you want to make sure one copy is running on every machine. So to do that, it's the same Docker service create. All you do is specify mode equals global, and you'll get one copy of that blue container on every, what example did I give here, Prometheus. So you'll get one copy of that Prometheus container on every node in the cluster. Thank you. Thank, thank you, yeah. Uh, we're, we're excited about that too. And we're excited about all of this. Let me talk about constraints. Um, people often say, okay, I want certain containers to only run on these certain nodes. Uh, very logical request. So the feature, the mechanism that we've implemented is based on engine labels. And that's a feature that's actually not new to Docker. When you start up the Docker daemon on a particular machine, you can, pass it a, you can pass it a label, which is just a key value pair. And they're just arbitrary text. You can put anything in, in the value part. So in this case, I've, I've specified the label com example storage equals SSD, meaning that those two green boxes on the right have SSD drives. Now, let's say we want to schedule some workloads that will only run on machines with SSD drives. Uh, it's the, this is the same command I've, I showed you before. All I did was add constraint uh, com example storage equals SSD. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so w all that's happening here is I'm matching up the constraint when I do Docker service create with the uh, engine constraint that I specified when I started the engine. And that will cause the containers to get scheduled to only those engines. And you can scale up now. That's the second command here. Again, the new containers will only go to those engines up to the resource limits of the engine. In, in general, if you try to schedule workloads to an engine or to a cluster beyond the resources of that cluster, they'll just, that, that desired state will be preserved, but it can't be realized. And so what happens is we just basically just wait until new resources become available before trying to schedule uh, additional containers. It, what I've represented in this case is there were enough resources on those two nodes to run all 10. But maybe if you specified scale front end equals 100, there just wouldn't be enough CPU or RAM to do that. And you'd have some, some containers that were not able to get scheduled yet. Now I want to turn my attention to something that is a little more complicated. And we didn't get to it in the keynote for the sake of simplicity. But if you've come to this session, you're probably going to be interested in this. Um, so far, we've talked about services as a collection of containers. And that's literally true, but 
it doesn't tell the full story. What we set out to do, what the SwarmKit team set out to do, and for those of you who don't know, SwarmKit is the technical foundation of Docker 112 integration. It, it's not uh, a separate product. It's not something that uh, you would use standalone, but it's, it's the GitHub repo where all of our orchestration technology is, uh, was written, and then we compiled that into the engine. So what the SwarmKit team set out to do was build a system that could schedule more than just containers. In fact, just a general purpose scheduler. So you might imagine in the future we want to schedule, well, VMs, uh, unikernels, um, any kind of you know, naked processes that are not containerized, basically any type of workload. This, this system that we've built is designed to allow you to schedule it. And the way that we do that is with an indirection layer that we call tasks. So we've talked about services. A service is something like Redis. I want, uh, I want to bring up a Redis service, and I want three copies of it, right? Three replicas. M you know, maybe those are three different instances of Redis that are going to replicate data amongst each other. This is a common scenario. What we then do is, create three tasks within that service. And a task is like a slot for a workload. It, the task itself doesn't do anything. It just represents the need to execute a workload. Right now, the only kind of task we support is a container task. So the next step in the process is that th these three tasks will be satisfied by starting containers. But again, in the future, maybe we support unikernel tasks, for example. So you, could, you would have three unikernels, or VMs, or any other type of, of uh, process, you know, long-running process. This is a concept that I think Andrea will come back to. Uh, now, I want to talk about stacks and distributed application bundles, which is something that was introduced in the keynote it's a new idea for us. It's something we're really excited about. So in the top left, I'm just showing you the same thing I, sh I showed you before. OK, a service, it has three tasks. Those tasks are, are instantiated in the form of containers. Now, suppose that you want to group several tasks. Suppose you want to group several services together. Like you have a front end service, a Redis service, uh, maybe you have a report service that's running in the background, reading the Redis and generating reports. You can bundle all of those together into what we call a stack. And that's a representation of your entire application. Now, here's why I bring this up. As you heard from Solomon and then uh, heard again in the last keynote demo, we're introducing a new file format called .dab files, distributed application bundles. And these are our multi-service images that instantiate stacks. So you've now got a hierarchy of concepts. At the bottom is a single service. Those services can be grouped together into a running stack. Now, how do you bring a stack into existence? You deploy a bundle. Or, or you know, a distributed application bundle, if we want to use the full, the full name. And these distributed application bundles are just text files. Now, I, I want to be upfront here. This, is, this file format is a work in progress for us. We're releasing it as experimental in Docker 1.12. So Docker 1.12 is the, it's currently in a release candidate state. We're going to release it GA in let's say mid to late July, we're you know, still in the process of finalizing it. But when we do, this functionality is still going to be experimental. And we're going to be soliciting a lot of feedback from the community and you know, interaction on GitHub, suggestions, ideas about how we should evolve this. Because our hope for distributed application bundles is that they'll become a, an industry standard. And in, in much the same way that the Docker image format has become essentially the de facto industry standard for single container images. So this is, this is an area that is ripe for community contribution. Uh, we have discussions going on GitHub. 
We, we would love more participation. We, you know, we have an opinion about this, that it should be a JSON file, that it should be generated from a composed file, but this, this could go in several different directions, and that's kind of the state of where we are right now. Um, I just want to wrap up with one more slide, and I think this was mentioned in the keynote, but it's really important. Uh, all of these swarm mode features that we've talked about are completely optional. So if you're currently running Docker in production, which I'm guessing at least some of the people in the audience are, I know there, there are many people who are, um, you, don't, you don't have to use these features. And if you don't, nothing's gonna break. So if you're using an existing third-party orchestrator, and I'm, I know that there are some, some out there, some are quite popular, <laughs> Um, you just keep using it, okay? It's not, we're not trying to break other people's systems that have built on top of us. We believe that we can provide a better user experience by integrating orchestration features into the platform itself. But we're not trying to mess with anyone else's project or you know, anything like that. So everything's fully backwards compatible. We won't break your existing system if you upgrade to Docker 112. And uh, I just think this point can't be stressed enough because, you know, in an enterprise environment, the thing people hate to hear is, oh, there's a new version and it's going to break everything. And we're very sensitive to that and we won't let it happen. Let me talk briefly about this routing mesh. So we touched on this in the keynote. Um, I just want to show an example again of how it works because it's kind of a complicated concept and I just, I, I want to make sure it really sort of sunk in um, during that brief keynote demo. So let's start with the command at the bottom. It's the same command as before, by the way. We do docker service create. We ask for three replicas. It, the container is called front end. It's on a certain overlay network, okay. And we're mapping port 80 of the container through to port 80 on each node in the cluster. So that's what's represented. Each of those green boxes has a port 80 antenna sticking out. So what's going to happen here is that was an operator chosen port, and every node is listening on that port. And so if you look at that black, I don't know what that is, an MS-DOS terminal or something, <laughs> um, the user accesses myapp.com colon, oh, there's a typo. That should be colon 80. Um, the point is the user accesses the app on the exposed port, and he or she probably, because of an external load balancer, happens to hit worker two, which is great because worker two is running two copies of the front end container. So worker two can easily service this request. It has, it has two, in fact, two copies of the process running. But what happens if the user accesses myapp.com colon 80 and gets directed to worker three, which has no copies of the container. What, what we've done with the routing mesh technology is, we've said, okay, even though you're accessing worker three, which has no copies of the container, we're going to transparently redirect that traffic to another node in the cluster that is running the container. In this case, I picked work, worker two. But the routing mesh could have picked worker one. It also has a copy. And th this is really powerful, just, just to reiterate, because your external load balancer or external users, however you want to set this up, does, don't have to know about where the containers are running. And that means that if one of these front end containers uh, goes down and or, you know, Two of them go down, so worker two can no longer service requests. The routing mesh will automatically redirect it to worker one. And I know a lot of people ask me, doesn't this introduce extra hops in, into, the, into the system? And we, we've built on proven Linux technologies like IPVS, uh, kernel space, pa you know, packet routing, in order to make this very efficient. So we can't. If a request comes into worker three, the reality is yes, there's gonna be a hop to another machine, but we do it as quickly and efficiently as possible. And this, this allows you to have this abstraction that your entire cluster is like a single machine. 
Lastly, I just want to talk briefly about uh, security out of the box. And um, I mentioned this in the keynote, but there's this notion of cryptographic node identity, uh, which you can use for workload segregation, payment card processing, for example. Uh, there's no insecure mode in Docker 112 orchestration. There's no, like, there's no way to turn off security. It, and that's something we did very intentionally, because our view is security should be so simple to use that you shouldn't want to have to turn it off. And I've actually watched over the past three months as, as the engineers on my team are using security w you know, without even noticing it and, and with no objections, which I've never seen on an engineering team before. Normally it's like, hey, I need to debug this. Can we just shut off all this encryption and just, just let me, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> and who can blame them? But we've put a lot of thought into building an architecture that is secure by default. And as a result, people are not asking to do that. And they're very happy about it. Uh, I just want to briefly cover two more features, and then I'm going to turn it over to Andrea. And these are, these are unrelated to swarm mode. First off, container health checks. Uh, this is a feature that we're building into Docker images. So if you're an image author, you can specify what it means for your container to be healthy. So if my container is a web server, or you know, a, uh, let's say my container is a Python Flask app. It listens on port 5000. I can write into my Docker file, OK, every 30 seconds, check this container and make sure it can serve uh, the you know, index page on port 5000. If it can't, put it in an unhealthy state and let the orchestrator deal with bringing it down and, and replacing it with a healthy one. The last thing we're doing at least the last thing I'm covering is uh, we have a new model for plugins, and we're really excited about this. In the past, installing plugins was complicated. You had to log into each host one by one. You had to put a binary in a certain directory. It was, you know, it, it, it wasn't a smooth process. What well, we've introduced in Docker 112, and this also is an experimental feature. We're going to iron out some issues with it and get it GA by 1.13, which is our September, late September release. But the idea is you can do Docker plugin install some plugin. Then you can do Docker plugin enable the plugin and, or disable. And this is the entire workflow. The engine will go out to Docker Hub, it'll fetch the plugin code, and it'll run it as if it was a container. And what's cool is plugins now have a manifest that specifies what kind of access they need. So, you know, if you think about like smartphone apps, you download an app and you get prompted like, okay, this app wants access to your address book, your photos, you know, your location, yes or no. And it's the same thing here. You know, this app wants host networking and it wants to mount a path. And then as an operator, you just say, yeah, that's okay, or no, I'm rejecting it. So a streamlined plugin process that makes it easier for, for operators to use plugins. OK, that concludes my part. I want to turn it over to Andrea. Thank you. Hey, everyone. So um, Mike just showed the, the main features we have in Docker 112. And even though they look very simple, uh, what's going on in the, like, on the back end, it's quite complex. And um, so I just wanted to show like architecture because I think it's kind of cool. Um, so here's a swarm topology. Like you have you know, a bunch of nodes interconnected and it just works. Um, but let's go one level deeper and see what's going on. So as it turns out, uh, nodes have roles. So a node can either be a manager role or a worker node. What it means in practice is um, manager roles are responsible to actually orchestrate the cluster, perform the you know, health checking, scheduling containers, serving the API, and so on and so on, while worker nodes are just executing the containers and handling you know, incoming packet requests. And that's because in a typical you know, production setup, you actually want to segregate the two. And uh, on the security model, a worker has strictly no access to your data or API. Like a worker cannot decide to schedule containers on a different machine. A worker cannot you know, change the desired state. And, and, 
and anything else. It can only take work and report back on its status. The interesting part of uh, Docker is that every node is actually born the same. You get to uh, change the role dynamically through the API or CLI. So you can do node promotion or demotion. So you can, you know, you would start a cluster, you start with one manager, bring up a few extra nodes, and then dynamically you can say, okay, I actually want to have five managers. And so you're gonna type Docker node promote, enter the node ID, and eventually it's gonna become a manager. And that system uses the same reconciliation loop we use for, uh, for containers. So uh, the machine will go on and try to reconcile the state, which uh, we set to uh, manager. So if we go one level deeper, uh, actually, that's what's going on. So manager and workers are on two different kind of uh, networks. I mean, they use a different communication model. So managers have a built-in RAF system that allows them to share information, do leader election, because uh, only one manager is actually performing uh, scheduling at a time, and then they use uh, a leader follower model to figure out which one is supposed to do what. On the other side, you have workers. So workers are just you know, in a gossip network, which is uh, very, very fast, but not, you know, it's only eventual consistent. And the two of them talk through gRPC. So if we go even deeper, um, here's like um, a bunch of managers, well, actually three managers. So we embedded Raft not only you know, because it's simple, but because giving access to the orchestrator to those you know, low-level uh, distributed system primitives uh, has a bunch of advantages. First of all, uh, we have a built-in uh, data store, so we don't rely on an external one, which means that uh, we were able to do a ton of optimizations. For instance, the entire cluster state, so the desired state and actual state, is persistent, well, it's present in memory on each and every manager. So since orchestration is a very you know, uh, read-heavy uh, system, like whenever you want to schedule one container, you have to uh, query all the nodes, query like a bunch of containers that run in each of the nodes, compute some data, and then perform one write to say, okay, I'm gonna put this container on that machine. In this case, uh, we can perform all the reads to, through memory without you know, touching a hard drive or a networking cable, and then we just issue a single write. We also get to index the data in any way we want. So compared to a generic key value store, when it's just you know, a key and value blob, here we can index and under the machines by uh, labels directly if we want to query them faster. We can index services, or, well, actually tasks by their service. So we can perform very fast queries on, on our personal data model. And finally, we were able to do other uh, optimizations. For instance, uh, let's say that our rack switch goes down. And usually, if you add like a, an external store, you would need to do queries, schedule containers, and for each of, of those containers running the rack switch, you would need to issue a, a key value right to say, okay, this container must migrate to the other one. Uh, in Docker, uh, we're able to squeeze those uh, changes together and do batch writes. So uh, all the members in the raft can actually receive like a batch log. And so uh, a rack switch goes down, you only have to perform one raft write, which is the slowest part of the system because you have to gain quorum. On the other side, we have the workers. So they use uh, gossip. Uh, it's eventually consistent, so we use it only for stuff like the routing mesh and load balancing rules. What it means, um, when a container starts on a machine, you have to tell all the other machines that that container started. And it would take you know, a lot of traffic to, for the manager to send that to all the workers. So the managers don't do anything. Uh, the worker gets the, the, the container and then starts broadcasting that through, uh, through gossip, which is optimized for you know, heavy traffic. So every node can relate data to other nodes and uh, eventually will converge to the things you want. Gossip doesn't give us security out of the box, like the MTLS. So uh, something kind of cool we found is to, um, Gossip can only use like a symmetric like encryption key because it's UDP. So what we do is we generate one key 
uh, on the manager side, we put in a raft, we do automatic rotation, and then we push that key down to all the nodes every few seconds. And so that allows us to secure that, that layer through, through raft, actually. So going one uh, you know, level deeper, um, taking here a node, actually I have a manager node and a worker node. So I'm gonna briefly explain like, what's going on on the uh, swarm kit. Uh, thingy, which is the plumbing tool that we use to, to build uh, orchestration in Docker. So um, you send the A command to uh, the API, like service create. <coughs> the API is the uh, gateway into the system, so we validate that the service looks all right, and then it will just you know, save it into a raft layer. There's another component called the orchestrator that watches for uh, changes both in the desired state and actual state. It will see that a new service was created and will try to create uh, you know, the appropriate number of tasks to fulfill that request. As Mike explained, uh, we don't talk about containers here. We're, you know, uh, we only orchestrate directly tasks. So those could be VMs or unikernels, like the system doesn't care. The step after, so we, we created those tasks, we go to the allocator, so the allocator runs on the manager and is able to allocate unique resources, IP addresses, uh, VXLAN IDs, and all that stuff. Finally, it goes into the scheduler, which will try to find a machine where, the node, uh, where that task can run. It goes into the dispatcher, so the dispatcher is the endpoint for the workers. The worker connects to the dispatcher, grabs the work to do, and gives it to the executor, which finally translates the task into a container. We have um, orchestrators, are, it's, it's just a simple interface. We have a couple of those uh, right now. We have uh, replicated, which allows you to scale to a given number of instances. We have global, which sets a container on every machine, and we can add uh, more, and we will add more. Uh, same for schedulers, so all the species are actually swappable. And same thing with the executor. Today, anyone can just take uh, you know, our plumbing tools and start orchestrating uh, VMs if they want to. Um, internal load balancer, we do, uh, we have virtual IPs, we have DNS, service discovery, every service gets a virtual IP, it's routed and it's discoverable. Yada, yada. And um, we have also the ingress load balancer, which you saw in uh, all the previous demos, like the AWS one. So uh, you get a port allocated to the allocator, which we saw like it runs in the manager. That gets spread through gossip. Uh, on every box, and so suddenly they will reconfigure locally their IPVS stack to route packets to, to, the, right, uh, to the right nodes, the right containers. And uh, the cool part here is, um, so the, the worker gets information, configures IPVS, but then we're not on the serving path. So the packets basically transition directly from one kernel to the other one without going through us. Finally, uh, something uh, we talked a lot about security, so how do we do that? Uh, every node has a crypto identity. Uh, manager nodes, actually, when you do a swarm init, what it does is bootstrap the cluster. One step of that is to generate a root CA. So the root CA uh, can be encrypted using some flags, but otherwise uh, gets replicated to the other machines through our consensus layer. And uh, the nodes, when they connect, so the workers, when they connect, you get to set an acceptance policy. So you could say, well, actually, I want to do a manual acceptance. So I want to type Docker node accept. Or you can actually set up secrets. So Docker Swarm join requires to pass a secret token. Once the node is approved, it gets a certificate uh, sent down. And then every, and it's configurable, every few hours, minutes, uh, that certificate gets rotated and we push down a new version. So in case a, a worker machine gets compromised, so you can reject it, and it's gonna be cut off the network immediately, and after a while, its certificate is gonna be expired, so it's not even gonna be able to talk to any peers. We have, uh, so there's a lot to cover here, and uh, we have two related talks. Uh, there's one today about security, where they're gonna go deeper into the, our security model, and tomorrow, there's a network in deep dive, which will cover uh, all the routing mesh and load balancer we talked about. Thank you.
So we have about 10 minutes for questions before lunch officially starts. If you do have questions, please come up to the um, mic stands here, and I'll leave it up to these guys to uh, call on people. So there's, all right, there's two, two mic stands or one? There's one. There's two. There's one oh, oh there okay, two. okay. All right, so Can let's just alter. Balance, like yeah, yeah, we're going to load left, balance. Right, left, right, uh, right. <laughs> so left, please. Left, uh, we'll start with left. Thank you. Uh, so there's a lot of communication going on here, um, both kind of from a coordination perspective, um, uh, the command and control perspective, as well as kind of like port, map, port mapping happening for containers that are serving requests. How do you recommend this play well with host level firewalls? So, um, so first of all, something we need never mentioned so far is the port mapping part. You only want to do it when you want to expose a specific port, uh, a specific service to the outside. Uh, by default, if you use, uh, by default, Docker will use the overlay driver. So if a service wants to talk to another service within the same swarm, you don't even need to expose the ports. They will just go through overlay networking, which uses open with switch and so on and so on. So I think there are a few ports to open, which must be somewhere in the documentation. And yeah. once it's done, like, they will just encapsulate the traffic and route it to the right machine. When you expose the port, uh, actually, it's the same system. So. Um, there are some rules, like the packets with that port gets flagged, and then they go into IPVS, which routes them, so they don't even get to user space. And I guess my point is, uh, if you put like IP table rules on the, on the box, like at the top, they will be honored before ours. So you can uh, do whatever you want to do. OK, so that IPVS will put roughly double the load on the switch. Is that right? I believe so. OK, yeah. thanks. Sure. OK. Could you explain the distinction between a DAB file and a Docker Compose file? You said earlier that you could okay. generate one from the other. Why not just use Compose? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So our long-term goal is to integrate uh, Compose files, meaning the, the declarative uh, YAML files that exist today, Compose v2, into the Docker CLI. So, that, so Docker Compose would not, at some point in the future, Docker Compose would not be a separate tool so much as it would be the same set of functions in the Docker CLI. And um, what we're trying to do with DAV files is a little bit different. What we're trying to do is create a redistributable uh, artifact, a multi-image redistributable artifact that you can uh, run. It's completely portable. You can run it on any environment. So, Compose and DAB files are actually serving two different purposes. A Compose file is, is letting a developer describe his or her application, whereas a DAB file is once you've described your application and you've run it through a compiler to create the DAB file, now you can share this file with, with anyone. You can share it with your, your production ops, and it will run on uh, any, any production system. I have two, but very simple questions. Uh, one is uh, auto-scaling, and another one co-location. So in the demo, I showed like how you can force to scale to particular uh, unconditional numbers. So is there a way to auto-scale with like CPU load and so on? Uh, so you mean vertical scaling or like dynamic? Uh... Dynamic uh, addition of containers on different uh, machines. Yeah, it's not in the current 112. It's a roadmap feature for us. Uh, I think our commercial product, UCP, will add it first, but uh, we do plan to get there. Yeah. Uh, 113. Yeah. My, <laughs> my, my, uh, my take on that. So uh, it's not shipped. It's going to come. Um, I personally believe that auto scaling doesn't, you know, solve all the problems. Like um, you. So you can set up auto scaling to automatically, you know, add containers. But let's say that you had a bunch of front ends, and now they're becoming slow. So you add more, but turns out that they became slow because they were sending too many requests to the database. So auto scaling is going to make the problem worse. So it's not the answer to everything. It's coming, but like, there's still going to be some, you know, capacity planning going on, and it, it doesn't solve all the problems automatically. Clear. And the second one, collocation, is. Uh, services which run uh, in uh, containers and talk to each other, uh, would it uh, try to 
optimize it to talk to uh, another uh, container of, uh, on the same machine, or it will just round them, round the robin? Uh, so you have a few knobs you can turn. So when you start a service, you can set independently like the uh, resource reservations and the resource limits. The limits are going to be what uh, the worker node is actually going to enforce. And then the reservation is how much you want to reserve uh, at the scheduler level. So let's say that you have a machine with one gig of memory. Uh, if you start a service and say, I want to reserve one gigabyte, it will go to that machine and nothing else will, because now that, that memory is yours. Uh, in other examples, uh, if you set like a lower reservation, uh, we're going to fill the machines with as many reservations as possible. And then we're also going to enforce uh, the limit. So you can do stuff you know, like overcommit or dedicate machines and stuff like that just by turning th those knobs. Yeah, I, I had in mind something like, like if you have a front-end service and it's calling the, uh, let's say, database service, uh, would it uh, uh, call the same container uh, all over again uh, on the same machine or just randomly pick another container of different service? Um, Yeah. So I think what you guys are asking about is co-scheduling, and that's a good example of how the task model could be extended. So some systems have a, a notion of pods, which means the two containers are co-scheduled on the same machine. We haven't implemented that yet. We think there's pros and cons of doing that. But if we wanted co-scheduling, that's another extension of the task model that, that we could implement. Uh, can I go to the right? <clears throat> Hi, yeah. I wanted to ask. With the security model, with the automatic enrollment, um, how many knobs can you twiddle there? It seems very batteries included, but do you expect to be able to allow people to provide their own root certs, um, oh, set yeah. up policies for yes. rotation, yep. um, various yeah, yeah. standards? Uh, so so th there's going to be lots more like in the security talk, but uh, and I'm not the expert on, on that part, but basically you can provide your own intermediates. Uh, internally, it uses CFSSL, which has like a REST API, so you can point it to your own uh, CA. So you can support like hardware CA or, or whatnot, and you can extend it. So I think in UCP, so like the Docker Enterprise uh, product, actually it's going to use an external one, which can be backed by hardware keys instead. Yeah, and also for certificate rotation, it's totally configurable. Like we have a sensible de default, I think we're going to ship with like two weeks or something. But mm -hmm. you can configure it as, as frequently as like every one minute yeah. if you want that. Yeah, kind like, of like everything else, basically we made sure that we had enough like insecurity not to be ashamed of releasing that. And right. it's yeah. pretty cool. But then you can just swap it out with whatever you want. OK, thank you. Yeah. Sir. Um, yeah, so our question is, uh, if you're having a, uh, basically, say, multiple applications, each in their own stack, does it make more sense to basically deploy those in multiple swarms? Or would you have like one swarm, possibly even spanning multiple availability zones, where you would basically have these multiple stacks sort of co-inhabited? So uh, the recommended uh, setup, uh, you can have a swarm in multiple uh, AZs, so in multiple availability zones, but not like it shouldn't spawn across multiple regions at the same time. That's because like uh, those are the boundaries of doing you know raft. Like latency is important, so uh, a swarm should be within the same region. If you want to have multi-region, then you're going to deploy multiple swarms and then just manage them independently. What about yeah. multiple apps in the same swarm? Is that? Oh, uh, if you have multiple, I, I would put them on the same swarm. OK. Uh, they, so there's a notion of uh, stacks and networks. Uh, that's pretty old, like from Docker 1.7. But basically, you can create a network per application, which means that you know, they run on their own private network, and no other application can talk to that. Or you can join the, the networks together if you want to. It's up to you. So there's a you know, Docker network create, Docker network attach, and a bunch of other commands that allows you to define the network topology. All right, thanks. OK, we have time for one more question. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so I had a quick question um, on the capabilities you're introducing for the router mesh. Is there any capability to selectively steer traffic going between different nodes to, say, another service which is doing L4, L7 inspection or something like that? Is there any? traffic redirection capabilities for advanced security. You're advanced asking about a deep packet inspection? I didn't hear. Yes, that. correct. OK, OK. Uh, so the, the cool thing, um, 
the sorry, Mike's. Uh, the so there's a built-in one that works pretty well. Uh, actually, you can use those primitives to do your own custom load balancer on top. So, for instance, uh, right now we're exposing directly a service uh, to a port. Instead, if you want to, you could expose like an issue proxy or Nginx or whatnot, and basically just ask it to route the uh, packets back to the VIP, and so it goes back into our the other load balancer. So basically, you can do a man in the middle with your own load balancer, and that allows you to do you know, green, blue deployments, canaries, and whatnot. So you, you get to place your own code in between uh, one load balancer and the other one, and so you can do whatever you want. OK, thanks. OK, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. We'll be, yeah.